Is that better? Is that good? Okay. Well, I guess we can get started just a few minutes early, then you guys can leave a few minutes earlier. But uh, my name is Jonathan Smith, um, and we're going to talk about Wi-Fi today. The um, interesting thing is today is the first time that my presentation that I've given, I've given several different presentations and different conferences and whatnot has actually been before lunch. All, every single presentation I've ever given has always been the time slot right after lunch. And so this is the first time that um, everyone will be mostly focusing on food instead of sleeping after the lunch. So this will be exciting. But um, we're going to talk about Wi-Fi. Uh, Wi-Fi is something that whether you like it or you don't, we use it every single day. Um, a day doesn't go by where we're not, something that we're using isn't using Wi-Fi. Um, and we're going to talk about ways that we can break Wi-Fi or disrupt Wi-Fi. Um, but before we get into that fun stuff, we're going to talk about um, how it is a little bit about how Wi-Fi works. And I, and I like doing that because uh, if you truly understand a technology or understand something, then you can more efficiently and effectively break it, essentially, because you know the ins and outs. You know what you can do to break that, that process, that flow. Um, so we're going to go, we're going to go a little bit into how, how does Wi-Fi work? Because it is such an amazing technology and a great, great technology. Um, so wireless or Wi-Fi or 802.11, um, uh, the, the standard for Wi-Fi is 802.11, IEEE standards. Uh, Wi-Fi was a name that got coined later on. Um, by marketing people. That's usually where a lot of names come from for marketing people. Uh, so we are going to talk about the 802.11 standard. Um, it was originally started, uh, it was originally written and ratified in 1999. Um, that was a little while ago and some of you may not even remember having Wi-Fi, you know, in 1999. Uh, some of you may not even be born in 1999, but um, since then, there have been five significant changes to Wi-Fi. There has been hundreds of small changes and hundreds of smaller standards, but there's been five significant changes to Wi-Fi, and it's a lot. Um, the whole 802.11 standard is like 2,700, I think I've got, yeah, 2,793 pages last time I checked. That is a huge standard for one technology. Um, Something that, that has so much, um, so many variables and so many different things that, that can go uh, in with Wi-Fi. So the big question is, how does Wi-Fi work? How does 802.11 work? Well, the most simplest answer to that question is magic. That's how it works. Um, when you really get to understand and learn how Wi-Fi actually functions, it really is magic because everything tells you that it shouldn't work, but it does work, and it works really well. Um, now, for those who are familiar with, with RF or radio frequency, you'll know that, that RF in a single frequency or single channel is half duplex. Um, it's like walkie-talkies. If you've used walkie-talkies, only one person can talk at a channel at a time. That is exactly how Wi-Fi works. Only one device on a given channel can talk at a, uh, at a time. Um, and I mean, that is how, how it functions, one at a time. That's, that's pretty crazy to think about it, and we'll get more into even how that one at a time works. Um, another way that you can think about it is the game Musical Chair, um, but only one chair, and we're all playing in this room with one chair and the music's playing and we are all running around and once that music stops, whoever gets to that chair first gets to sit down and gets to transmit. Um, that's wireless, the musical chair. Um, so 
there's actually a process that a device has to use to be able to transmit. And this is what the, the flow looks like. Um, first, the device decides, you know what, I need to transmit something. And so it goes and it listens to the RF medium. It listens to whatever channel it's on, whatever channel the AP is on that it's associated to, listens, and if no other device is talking, then it will be able to transmit. Um, and what happens is if, if it listens and it hears, you know, hears as in it can pick up that electrical noise uh, that someone, another device is transmitting, it has to wait. It has to go back and it has to set a random time and it counts down. And once it's done counting down, it will go back, it will listen, make sure that that medium is free. If the medium is free, then it will go on to transmit. Uh, if it isn't free, then guess what? It has to go back through that process again. It has to start back at the beginning, has to pick up a timer, has to count down to that timer, and then go. And so you can already start to picture, it's like, how does this function? How does that even work when every single device goes through that process? Everything. Um, we have our frames. We can send one frame at a time. Uh, and, I mean, of course, there are newer standards that's al that allows us, uh, devices, to send more frames at a time. But basic wireless that most networks function, one frame at a time. The frame MTU, or packet size, is about 2,300 bytes. Uh, so to put that in perspective, you know, that that's about 300, yeah, 300 floppies that, that can be transmitted at a time. So, I mean, physically that sounds like a lot, but for those who have used floppy drives know that you can't fit much, and especially in today's age, you really can't use much in that. Um, and to think about it, so the average YouTube video, 10 minutes, that's HD, it's over 2 million frames that it'd have to send for one video, for one device. And that doesn't even count all the other frames that we'll get into that have to be sent along with that. Um, so uh, there is a lot that goes into to being able to send that single frame to be able to uh, create that connection. Um, there's, there's two ways of, well, three ways of, of being able to, to do this. There's what's called a request to send and a clear to send. And essentially how that works it's similar to TCP, if you're familiar with the TCP uh, handshaker process. Uh, the device decides that he needs to send something, that that device needs to send a frame. And so it checks the medium. No one's transmitting. Okay, I'm going to ask if I can send this frame. Sends out the, the uh, request to send frame. And then the AP listens, and he hears that request to send. And it, it decides that, yeah, that device, you can send your information. So he sees it, and he sends, yes, you can send your frame. And so the device then is able to send its frame. So it goes through that four-step process, and most networks, depending on where you're at, that's how it's set up, is, is request to send and clear to send. Now, it's getting more and more that, that you can tune tune it to be able to kind of cut back some of those steps. Um, and then after the AP gets it, of course, it has to send an acknowledgement so that the device knows, okay, good. AP got my request or got my frame. I'm good to go. And now think about this with, with just a simple TCP, uh, a simple TCP request, like going to a website. So with TCP, there's a four-way handshake of, you know, request, basically, and then I uh, add on top of that four for wireless. So each of those four packets that are sent for TCP have four additional packets for request to send and clear to send. So you can see where the frames just start stacking up on top of each other. Tons and tons and tons of frames. Now we can streamline that with uh, different technologies and different 
amendments to the 802.11 where you can just have the, the device will just send it and hope that the AP hears it. And if the AP hears it, then it will send back the acknowledgement that, okay, I heard that. Now, there are times where you can go half of that and you'd have just a request to send or a clear to send. Um, and I won't get into too much detail there, but essentially what I'm trying to paint the picture of is it takes a lot to send a single frame. And you'll see why, when we get in a minute, why that makes a difference. And that poor MacBook over there hasn't been able to send this whole time because it's been using that process of listening and it's been hearing that conversation. But now essentially, mm, you know, after that conversation, it's able to speak. So, yes, all of that. All of that it takes to be able to send a single frame. And every single device, every device that follows the 802.11 standard has to play that game, including the AP. The AP, just because it's an AP doesn't mean that it can, you know, do whatever it wants. It has to play that game. And on top of that, the AP is sending out beacons, uh, 10 beacons every second. And so it's having to deal with all of the devices, the beacons. Um, so we can just see how the, the medium, the w wireless medium gets so congested with these frames because with just normal, normal communication without anything malicious. It just gets flooded with these frames being sent. Um, so, you know, the process, that includes two uh, frames or to beacons. And the beacons are what, you know, when you click on your Wi-Fi symbol and you see all those networks, those are beacons because those APs are sending out those beacons. Um, management frames, the APs have to send out a lot of management frames so that clients can adjust settings or change things. And that all has to play that game. And that's what most traffic is. So on top of our normal traffic, then you add you know, 60 to 70% on top of that of just management frames. Um, so you can see how this is just, you know, how when we say it's magic, it really, I mean, when you think about it, because every device just decides when to send and has to pick a timer and is able to use some of, you know, the preamble of a header to be able to decide, okay, that frame will be sent out this many seconds or milliseconds, so I'm going to wait and then add on top of that so I don't overwrite someone else. Very similar to back in the days of hubs, if you're familiar with that, where before they had to send a packet, they listen and go from there. Um, so on top of that, on top of all those frames, we move to, uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit about modulation, and that will make a little bit more sense later on when we talk about some type of attacks towards Wi-Fi. So modulation is essentially how many bits or ones and zeros can I fit on a single transmission. Um, so we have different modulation schemes and the most basic is zero and one, you know, binary. So the each transmission is either a zero or a one. Now we have a uh, technology called OFDM or orthogonal frequency um, division multiplexion, which is it uses different characteristics of the energy wave to denote different uh, combinations of ones and zeros. Um, so we're up to uh, AC, which has a maximum of 256. So it's 256 qualm is what it's called, what that modulation is called. And, and essentially what that means is the device can send uh, 256 different combinations of ones and zeros depending on either the phase or the amplitude. And if you remember back in high school or uh, in calculus or trigonometry, you have your sine waves. You know, our phase is, is where the sine wave sits and our amplification is how tall it is. And so depending on different characteristics, they can interpret, okay, that is, you know, 0011111000. And that's how we gain speed is through modulation. We're able to, to, to increase the amount of, of ones and zeros we can send. Now, the way we achieve modulation and good modulation is through a clean RF environment. 
Um, if you picture yourself, let's say you're, you and your friend are on two buildings across the street, and you want to be able to communicate with each other. And so beforehand, you, uh, you and your friend decided we're going to have two posters. We're going to have a white poster, and we're going to have a black poster. Uh, and we're going to be able to communicate through that. And white means zero, black means one, and then you'll get your binary, and you'll convert that into ASCII, and we'll be able to communicate. And so you do that. And it takes quite a bit of time to be able to communicate between you and your friend. And so then you decide, well, let's add some more colors to this so that, you know, maybe green means yes, red means no, and, and so on. And so you're able to create this modulation of being able to communicate with each other. Now, when it gets dark outside, or let's say it starts raining, your visibility is a lot worse. So you can't, you can't really distinct the two different shades of green. And so you and your friend have to step back and say, okay, we can't use our different shades of green, so we've got to come back to you know, more simple colors that we can tell. That's what, your, that's what Wi-Fi is. That's what modulation is. is if, if the devices have too much noise and they can't pinpoint the difference between the phase or a difference between modulation, they have to step back on modulation and say, okay, we can't talk that fast. We've got to go back because I can't tell the difference. And you'll see when we get to the fun part, um, why, how this all comes together, and it makes sense of, of how these types of attacks are worked, is because Wi-Fi is, is um, vulnerable to these things the way that it's designed. So again, how, does, how, do we, how do we make this work? Magic. That's how it all works. Um, this is a great representation I found of how Wi-Fi works. I mean, you see that, I don't know where that intersection's at, but it just looks like chaos. You can imagine that those are our frames going around, but yet no collisions yet. Okay, so let's get to the fun, the fun stuff, the, the stuff of how we can break Wi-Fi. Um, we're going to talk, talk about two main types of attacks. Uh, if you, you look back at the OSI model, for those who, who know the OSI model, we're going to talk about layer one attacks and layer two attacks. Layer one attacks have to do with the physical medium. So um, RF, the frequencies, that's the physical medium. Layer two is the data link layer or frames, and we're going to talk about types of attacks on that. So first, first layer one. What is the main, main layer one type of attack? Well, it's a jamming. We've got a narrow band and a wide band jamming. Um, essentially, that's what a wide band jammer looks like. It takes, uh, it has a large amount of frequency or bandwidth that it can send and it essentially just makes noise. It doesn't even have to be anything. It's just, it's just noise. And as noise in the wireless world is just um, frequency. And it just blasts that out into the environment. And now when we think back about how Wi-Fi works, what is the first thing a device has to do to be able to, before it can send a frame? It has to listen. It has to listen to make sure that the medium is available. Well, if all it can hear is noise, then it doesn't, it doesn't know what that noise is, but it knows, oh, someone else is talking, so I can't talk yet. And so the device backs off, creates a timer, and then goes back and listens. Oh, no, there's still noise. I can't talk. And so a wideband jammer, can we can cover the whole spectrum of 2.4 or a big spectrum of 5 gigahertz. We can block out a huge section of wireless. Narrowband is essentially the same thing, but as you can imagine, narrow. It, it can either be a specific channel in wireless or a specific frequency. Um, and you can see, you know, we're, we're blocking, we're jamming that frequency, and you can see how, how the waves, you know, propagate out. Um, but the adjacent frequency or channels would be fine. And so one, one type of a device that is, that is very easy to make is a narrowband jammer. Now, uh, I decided to build build a device. Now, before we go on, I'll clearly state that 
my device wasn't a jammer, it was a signal generator. Uh, a signal generator is 100% legal. The FCC will not come after you for signal generating. Uh, the differences between signal generating and jamming is a signal generator is legal, signal jammer is illegal, and it's the way you spell the words, <laughs> basically. So, so, not jamming, we're generating. We are generating signals. But essentially, all I did is go on eBay, the, the good old eBay, and I bought, and you can part numbers up there if you want it. I think I paid like $2 from China, and they make these little modules for uh, wireless cameras. And it's all analog. It just sends out the signal in wireless. Um, and this chipset has four different settings of what, what frequency to send on. Now, it doesn't match up exactly. And you can see, I'm, I won't read it, but you can see that it's pretty close to where Wi-Fi sits. And so I took these four signal generating devices. I set one for e each of those frequencies attach some big antennas on there for gain and turn them on and that's it that that creates enough noise that it will block out all 2.4 um, gigahertz frequency then and a lot of networks still operate and only operate in 2.4 so you can cause some havoc there um, and it was all of two dollars i think the antennas were the most expensive part um, because I wanted high gain antennas. Um, so you can see when in your environments how this might cause issues. If, if someone is just, you know, usually jamming is just to be mean or to have fun or to troll, but jamming can also be used for different types of attacks, and I'll get into that. Um, jamming can be a very very serious, very serious type of attack. Um, the next type of, of attack in, in the layer one is like jamming, but a lot less. It's, it's just you're just sending out noise. And this is where modulation comes in. Because what's, what's worse than not having Wi-Fi at all? It's having slow Wi-Fi, right? Like, if your users don't have Wi-Fi, they've accepted that. They're like, okay, network's down. I can't do anything about that. But if it's slow, you won't hear the end of that. And so noise, you're just, you're just sending out enough noise that the device isn't able to pick that higher modulation scheme. Back to our, you know, us standing on our buildings to communicating, we're just adding rain into the into the environment so that you can't tell the different what the different colors mean so we've got to narrow that down and be able to step back our modulation to be slow and these types of attacks can be very hard to find um, and they're just annoying because they don't they don't do anything and you don't benefit anything maliciously from it it's just being you know mean basically um, so we have no defense against these types of attacks. I mean, how, how can you stop someone from jamming? You can't. The only thing you can do is detect it. Uh, you can get uh, a WIPS or a wireless intrusion prevention system, or most modern APs are able to recognize a jammer. And all you can do is set up alerting to be alerted that there's a jammer in the area. And then you can use different devices to triangulate where that's at. You really can't stop a jammer. Um, so we've gone through layer one types of attacks. It really isn't much, but it can do a lot of damage. So next we have our layer two types of attacks. Um, and the big, big type of attack in layer two is called the deauthentication attack. Um, and you can, you know, a picture of a of Wireshark and what a deauthentication frame is. And what, a, what is uh, an AP uses deauthentication frames for? There's various reasons, but like for example, a radius change of authorization or accounting uh, packet. You know, if, 
If for whatever reason you want that client to be disconnected, it will send a deauthentication frame. Well, you can see where we can abuse that because we can go and we can create our own deauthentication packet. We can send it to the MAC address FFFFFFFFFF, which is broadcast, and tell everyone to be uh, deauthenticated. And what the client does is when it hears that deauthentication frame, it says, oh, I have to get off this network. And so it de uh, deauthenticates itself, disassociates itself from the network and gets off the network. And then it may try and join it again, but those deauthentication frames are being sent out. And what this is used for is during the, the WEP and WPA2 uh, authentication when your client joins a network, there's certain things that are shared between the AP and the client. And you're not your password isn't being sent or the password isn't being sent, but there's different breadcrumbs and things that can be used to find out what that password is or, or to unencrypt the data. And so what happens is the authentication frames are used a lot of times to collect that because you have to collect a lot of that information to then be able to brute force it. And so what will happen is an attacker will listen to the medium, send out a bunch of deauthentication frames so that all clients disconnect, and then they'll turn off their deauthentication attack. And then what happens? All those clients will automatically start joining back in the network. And then they're able to be able to capture those, all those breadcrumbs to be able to recreate a hash or, or the key to be able to deauthenticate or to get your pre-shared key. Um, and that's where a lot of, besides just being mean, this is where this ma main type of attack is used. And what's, you know, now today we have these wonderful devices um, that you have on your badge, you know, these little microcontrollers, these little ESP microcontrollers. Uh, and what can they be used for? You can program them quite easily to deauthenticate. I mean, you can also use your computer if you have the correct wireless chipset that can do that to craft those packets or frames. But, you know, you can go and buy these little little devices that have a little o OLED screen on there. You can select, you know, if you want a certain client to be deauthenticated, if you want a certain group of clients that are connected to an AP to be deauthenticated, or if you want everyone to be deauthenticated. And this can, you know, these little things you, you don't have to have all that fancy screen and stuff. You could just buy the little chip, strap a battery to it, and leave it. And it would cause havoc. And you can buy these things on eBay for a dollar, if that. Um, and so you can see where, where this type of attack is very easy to do. And the next type of attack is, is called flooding. Now, <laughs> you might be wondering what the motorcycle has to do with flooding. The answer is absolutely nothing. I just forgot to put the right picture in this slide. So, but there's a motorcycle. So anyways, but flooding, so flooding is like the a jamming at layer two. And essentially what you do is you just send out frames and you just talk and talk and talk and talk. And there are ways to bypass that process of being able to get onto the wireless medium. And so you just send out your frames. And so essentially what happens is a device listens Oh, somebody else is talking. I can't talk yet. I'll wait. Oh, somebody else is talking. I can't talk. I'll wait. And so it's a, a little less efficient than just using a layer one or a physical jammer, but it is another type of attack. So what can we do to defend against these types of attacks? Well, at layer two, there's not much you can do. There is, there is a standard out there. It's 802.11w. Uh, or uh, management frames that are protected or hashed. Um, and in theory, it sounds great. So essentially what happens is between that four-way handshake, the APs and the clients create a hash algorithm that then they hash all management frames. And so then when a client receives a management frame, it runs it through the algorithm, it's like, nope, that is not a valid management frame, so I'm not going to do what it is telling me to do. The only problem with that and downfall with that is most clients, they don't uh, do that. They don't, they don't support 802.11w. 
And that's a, that's a problem because you look at, you know, the different standards that APs have to abide by. Well, clients, they don't have to abide by s those same standards. And so 802.11w would be wonderful if every single client worked on that, but not a lot do. And so if you enable that in your network, you'll have random clients, and it's usually like cheaper clients that don't work anymore because they don't support that. Um, and with flooding, you can't stop that. You can only detect it. And so these types of attacks, basically, it comes down to you really can't stop them, but you can detect them, you can find them, and then try and find the source of them. Um, but that's it. That's where you can contact me. I've got a website with lots of different posts about what, we, what I just talked about. Um, but thank you very much. Hopefully you enjoyed it and learned something.